Hey, I see our uh, our legislature has a big problem. That's they got to help the WVSSAC straighten out. Did you see the scores this weekend? Oh, mercy! <laughs> I mean, 90, 90, 90s, and these were their these were almost their halftime. I saw the halftime scores were just about that. I mean, allowing every football player from three, four schools to leave and go to one school really doesn't do anything. Well, but was that for the case? Though? Oh yeah, is that, is that Hurricane, the situation? From what I understand, fifteen of Hurricane's twenty-two starters were transfers. Everybody left South Charleston. Everybody left a couple of schools and went to Huntington or Hurricane. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're getting the single A, the best kids at the single A's, the double. I mean, it's it, it's wrong. It's not a um, it's not a positive for for anyone. So that we've seen scores like that in the past, but we've never seen a, in such a huge slate right. of scores like that in the past. Well, and it, and it was schools that have been great football schools for years just getting pummeled because everybody everybody left and went somewhere else. South Charleston, Capital. South Charleston, know, yeah. A couple, couple of schools that, you know, five, six years ago, we're talking about competing for championships, and they're getting shut out and or Capital did, I think, score like 28 points but gave up 80. You know, I mean, it was just incredible. It was interesting. Um, uh, we had an FCA meeting, uh, statewide meeting in Charleston last Tuesday, which is why I wasn't able to be here. And at the end of that meeting, uh, Tim Britton, one of our FCA reps in the southern part of the state, came up and asked me, hey, uh, what's the transfer rule done up in the eastern panhandle? And I honestly said, yeah, I, I know a few guys that have made some transitions from one school to another, but I don't think it's been anything major that I'm aware of. And he immediately said, well, down here, yeah, um, Interesting. kids are going to certain schools for certain sports. And he told me, be aware, George Washington will be the favorite for the basketball state championship because a, a whole slew of kids in that area that were very good at basketball have made the decision to be at GW. So High school dream teams. Just right? in droves. Apparently. Jim I mean, Klein is holding here. I'm going to bring Jim into the conversation, too, because he's uh, the former volleyball coach who won several state championships in uh, Maryland. Jimmy, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. So uh, you, your thoughts on what we're discussing right now with these transfer transfer rules that are in effect for the public schools? Yeah, you bring up a very good point. And I'd like to kind of switch the topic just a tiny bit. We called the, the Musselman volleyball match on Thursday night, and Musselman very early seemed to establish control in the match. And what you began to witness in the second and third game is freshmen and sophomores. Uh, there, there was a kid for uh, who set for the – the JV team, I think her name was Melton, she ended up uh, serving for Ada McCoy. So you got Ada McCoy, who's an all-state player, you know, one of the best. I think she's right now sixth in the state in kills. She's a dynamic player. But Coach Martz worked in sophomores and freshmen, and, and you end up in a situation where it could be a blowout. I mean, I'm not sure if it's, you know, like 90-3 to three type category, but – it perpetuates the longevity and the su- success of a program like Musselman because he puts kids in tough situations when they're very young, and it gives them a chance to continue. I mean, they've, he's won like I don't know eight or nine state titles. I don't want to you know mm-hmm. any misinformation, but think about that. If you're working in those younger players, you're not only are you perpetuating the culture, you're, you're helping to make the match more competitive. Kids are learning. I just think that that's a much better opportunity, a much better way for these kids to to learn sportsmanship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something Walker's always done with Martinsburg football. He's always gotten the young kids in, gotten them in fast, rotated kids in and out because he knows a it makes them better, and b it keeps his team better. Because when the guys when guys get injured or the following year when he needs these kids. They've already played. Matt, you can, you can speak to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it helps, too, when you have success. And, and I'm sure you know any coach will tell you the more you can be on the practice field, the better off you're going to be. And when you make deep runs into the playoffs, you get at, you know just one extra week of practice over other teams when you make the playoffs. And then you add a second and a third, and you go to the championship game, you've had an extra month. And you can bring up some of those freshman players that may not even get a chance to play in that stadium state championship game but they've got those extra weeks of practice and those reps and you know have been around the program and are learning what it takes to keep a program going the way that that it does 
I, I don't know. Uh, the transfer rules in college and, and now, you know, coming down to the, the high school level. And it, it's something that the legislature passed, right? They said, mm -hmm. hey, this, this is allowed. And it was stuff that was going on beforehand. I think, unfortunately, it, it may have turned out to be a little bit like the NCAA, where the, the, maybe there weren't enough rules in place, so to speak, so it just becomes the Wild West, and everyone's going, hey, I'm going to this school for this sport, or you know, I'm a basketball player, I'm going to this school, or whatever it may be. It opened it opened the floodgates. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, everybody wants to be Huntington Prep now, <laughs> without uh, without rules, without without players. I mean, schools programs are just going to die. You're just going to see athletic programs dying in schools. And it's, I mean, I I'm not a fan of it. I believe kids should have the ability. I like the previous rule where if you wanted to go somewhere else before the first day of your freshman year, you were allowed to. But after that, if you transferred without a reason, a move or a, mm -hmm. a change in custody, you had to sit out. It 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 made it now where I mean they're they're creating super teams. It's terrible. Well, I'm in in theory in favor of kids being able to di go to different schools, if for no other reason than the fact that obviously you know hey you go to school to get an education, but extracurriculars are a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. And if you're at a school that maybe they're just not good at something, maybe they don't have a good coach at this particular sport, why should that kid be stuck? with a coach who's not good right uh, it's not your fault you're in that school district that's where your house is located so why would why should you be stuck with a coach who's not good maybe the team isn't good because the coach just you know whatever for whatever reason hasn't mm -hmm. developed as a coach or hasn't put in enough time or effort or just isn't a good coach not everybody's a good teacher coaching is teaching and not everybody's mm -hmm. a good teacher yeah. well and and that i mean your point works in a utopian society i mean if everybody's doing things the right way or doing things for the right reasons yes but if you end up with three or four schools that that have all the players and every other school that has no one, you're going to, I mean, it's well, I think just, the, it's the bad. problem solves itself over time in the sense that there's only so many kids that can play. So at some point, if you think you're good enough and you're only getting a quarter of action in a blowout, you're probably not yeah. going to stay at that school. Yeah, and that, that was my thought, too. Uh, Tim talked about, you know, the, the, the kids going to a particular school in basketball, and he's like, you know, any of, of the top 10 players could be in the starting lineup. And that was my first thought was at what point does player number 10 go, I could be starting somewhere and I'm getting mm -hmm. three minutes a game. Right. Well, I want to go play basketball. When you look at Kentucky that gets all these five stars to play basketball, mm -hmm. And so many of them end up sitting on the bench, not playing and transferring out. And Kentucky, I mean, what, they've won one championship since he's been doing that. Mm -hmm. And they've fallen short many, many times because they don't have the continuity. Hey, Jim, I know that's not the reason why you <laughs> called in this morning, but we appreciate your contribution to the conversation. You've got a town hall meeting style meeting coming up soon. Yeah, you know, I, I had an opportunity. I went to the, the breakfast yesterday and before I guess we get into that conversation, I would like to say, you know, to offer my condolences. You talked about some of the, the different people who passed away recently, and uh, I had an opportunity to, to go on a stroll with Senator Blair. I'm not sure if you're aware, Senator Blair's father passed away this weekend, uh, was Sunday, not, no. and, you know, just a sad situation, and to see him there and persevere and you know, he told some stories about uh, the, the golf game, and I think he shot a, my goodness, a 77 one day last week, as his father did. So certainly thoughts and prayers, condolences go to, the, to that family. But in any case, he was there and supporting Parks and Recreation, as well as a large number of other elected officials. And it, it's something that's, you know, you take a, day, a great deal of pride, the War Memorial Park Association, Martinsburg, Berkeley County Parks and Rec, they do a great job. War Memorial Park, w without a doubt, is a gem of the co in the community. I see posts all the time on social media pages talking about, you know, what is there to do or where can you take your kids for family events or things like that. And I, I definitely believe between Poor House, War Memorial, and many of the other features of the county, this is, is something that is you know, an outstanding opportunity, for, you know, and, and a great place for the community. Um, with that being said, there obviously are some challenges. I think at the Berkeley 2000 Lambert Pool area, um, I worked for the Hagerstown YMCA for 10 years. So I have a little bit of experience in parks and recreation, servicing the community, providing those types of 
experiences for our children. And in a YMCA setting, a nonprofit, the challenges, managing volunteers, all of those different things, I completely understand what's going on. My question and the thought that I had, and it's something that was spoken over and over yesterday as I, I shook hands with Jim Barnhart and many of the other different people who were there, and they offered me advice. Everyone had advice. And the number one piece of advice that I received was to listen to, to your constituents. It's one thing to have a platform and, and to speak about it, but to provide the people in your district the opportunity to talk and listen and hear what their ideas are. And I appreciate that the city council at their 810 regular meeting entered a scope of work with civil and environmental Conservance, uh, consultant CEC. And there's a number of different uh, opportunities that have been discussed, a splash pad, splash pad with outdoor community pool, uh, an outdoor competition pool with a wading pool and a splash pad, and then even an indoor competition pool, splash pad, wading pad, pool, all of these different things. And CEC scope of work also will include evaluating the existing property to look at the future recreational amenities. The only thing that I thought that was missing in the well-thought-out, well-laid plans are when does the community have an opportunity to speak? And maybe I'm putting the cart in front of the horse, but I felt like before we go too much further, why should we wait for CEC to come back, there, the considerations to be presented to City Council by the end of 2023, but why should we wait three or four more months to hear from the constituents of Ward 5 or the 94th District to hear what they think maybe should go in that space. And I completely understand if the community comes forward and there's a, a huge movement to put in a big bear roller coaster, and it's not going to happen. I mean, there, there is some budget concerns. I understand there's geological constraints with the water table, but my concern was should we give the public an opportunity to at least meet and talk? And I figured in this new endeavor that I'm you know, undertaking, maybe this would be a good chance to pull the public together and to give the parents and, and the, the children who actually utilize that area the opportunity to have their voice heard. So, Jim, you'll be calling the community together when and where? Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we're going to meet. The, the Moose Club was very generous. They've provided us the use of their outdoor pavilion at no, no cost. So it's right next door to Berkeley 2000 and Lambert Pool. The event will start at 6 p.m. I've invited all of our local uh, city uh, officials. Uh, some of the appointed parks and recreation have been invited, Bob Williams. And the idea is to come together for one hour from 6 to 7 p.m. We'll be pretty stern with the, with the start and stop. And, and what we'll do is we'll try to, to establish order, not quite like Robert's Rules of Order, but we're going to limit citizen comments to about 10 minutes or, or – I'm sorry, two minutes or less, depending on the number of attendees. We will um, follow a very strict – opportunity to speak and ask the participants then yield when their time expires. I have a, I had a volunteer who's offered to bring a flip chart so we'll be able to record citizen suggestions actually on paper. And then I have a volunteer who's offered to take minutes. So what we, I would hope to happen if public officials don't attend, that's perfectly fine. We'll compile those notes and submit those to the city. And if they choose to share those with CEC, that's great. And if not, that's great too. But at least we've given the people who live in that area a voice and an opportunity to express their concerns, ideas, or suggestions. In the last nine years, I've always lived what is in today's uh, version of the 94th District. I lived on Woodbury Avenue for three years. And I remember in 2021, Right after the bad weather on July 4th, the pool was closed, and a friend of mine contacted me and said that her daughter was told that she wouldn't be able to lifeguard the rest of the summer because Lambert probably wasn't going to reopen. And getting involved in some of those conversations and having the opportunity to understand, you know, the challenges that Steve Catlett and Bob and all of those people have undertaken because it's an, an, an old pool, it's an old uh, a piece of equipment. 
But then again, in, in, in 1997 and 98 at the Hagerstown YMCA down at the corner of North Potomac Street, we were in a building that was 100 years old. The front desk was built from a ship that had, been, that had sunk in Baltimore's harbor, and that wood had been relocated to Hagerstown, and, and that's how that building was built. I participated in capital campaigns to, to to move that YMCA to its new location, and and that's the idea, to, to be able to generate that discussion to see, okay, is there enough community interest to do that, or what do people want, or what do they think we should do, and then – the, the 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 still the budgeting and the scope of work can be evaluated by the people who are far smarter than me and CEC and the city council. But at the very least, what we're doing is we're giving the citizens of the 94th district and Ward 5 and that area of town the opportunity to come together and talk about it. Matt Miller. So, Jim, will ideas that have already been put out there, the splash parks and so forth, will those be discussed in any way, kind of like presented and then allow the public to speak? Or is this solely public? You come in and tell us what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's a good question. So all I've done is I pulled a one pager right from the city's explanation for the time lane and the consulting firm regarding the scope to study pool options at Lambert Park. Um, I'm, I'm certain that some people are going to say no one wants uh, an indoor swim complex. I'm sure that some people are going to say no one wants this or that. But the fact is I've talked to a couple people that say they do want an indoor swim complex. And the people that I've spoken to have a position in community leadership. I'm not certain. You know, and, and let's take it a step further. There's no outdoor basketball court anywhere close to North Middle School. All the time that I lived on Woodbury and I watched the kids, whether or not it's walking to school in the morning or walking around in the afternoon, there, it would seem to me like there have to be opportunities to do something for these kids. So I'm hoping that the one pager will show exactly what the city explained. It was in their release after the 810 regular meeting. I'm going to present that to the public. I'm not, I'm not going to explain it. All I'm going to do is I printed the exact written language, pass it out, and then we will begin at 6 p.m. We'll call on people who have comments. We'll record their thoughts and ideas. When the two-minute time frame is up, depending on the number of attendees, then we'll move on to the next person. If someone from the city shows or Parks and Rec and they'd like to answer very specific questions, they're more than welcome to attend and have their voice heard as well. However, what I would like to do is I'd like to conclude the meeting exactly at 7 p.m., and we'd like to keep this as proactive as possible and positive, and I understand that there's, there, there could be some complaints. In the 10 years that I worked at the Y, I had plenty of complaints because there are some things that can be done better. There's some things also that are out of their control. I mean, the, the, the place in which the pool was built is a problem. So that's something that has to be dealt with. Hey, Jim, it's Jonathan. I got a question. Basketball. I mean, not only do they not have outdoor courts anywhere near there, but as we know, they have now taken away the fall basketball league, moved it down to the south side of the county instead of the Berkeley 2000 Rec Center, where, you know, a lot of the kids who live in downtown Martinsburg, the ones who are the kids who need activities the most, are not going to have an opportunity. I mean, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, for them to get down there. I mean, I, I think the Rec Center is taking a gigantic step backwards at this point. What are your, uh, what are your feelings about that? That, you know, that's a good point, and I guess that would be something that would need to be answered by someone who's on the the board. You know, I, I, I see Faith Hall has a comment that she's inviting people to come on the third Tuesday of each month to the to the, the Parks and Rec board meeting. That would be a question they need to answer. I, I did have uh, an email conversation regarding the, the fall basketball. It's my understanding the language that was used is, is that the seasons have been streamlined. Fall is a smaller season. I don't know what happened with summer basketball, but the answer that I was given is is that uh, winter, spring, and summer will take place at both locations. The games in the fall are played at the Randy Smith Center. So the natural question that comes to mind is, 
If you only have one family car or you have challenges with transportation and you live in the north side of the city, there could be issues with getting to the Randy Smith Center. And the fact is, when we had one Hagerstown YMCA and it was in the downtown of Hagerstown and you lived on the outskirts of the county, those challenges existed in that situation too. So I can't really answer that. I think that that's something that the Parks and Recreation Board of Directors and Bob and, and the, the people who are much smarter than me might need to discuss. But you definitely raise a good point. There, there, the other comments that I received are seasons are shortened. I'm sure that there are costs that are involved that need to be reconciled. So maybe that's what changes the number of games that are played. But to lose um, the pool, to lose the situation with fall basketball, to not have oh, an and the the to summer play. basketball too that the kids lost. Right. I mean, well, they're they're not really at this point serving the the kids of the inner city of Martinsburg as well as they have in the past. We we've talked we talked to Bob Williams on the air a while ago. We've talked to a lot of people, and it it just the bottom line is those are the kids that that need that need us the most that that need opportunities and need stuff to do the most and they're the ones that are having it taken away from them. and that I mean I I personally don't like that uh, you know I would think it's a challenge I, I I do know that Parks and Rec have done what they thought that they could do to make the situation with the pool as best as it could be and I I talked with Jennifer Smith last week she reminded me that bus passes have always been available for families to to go from Lambert to to War Memorial so in some cases, there have been strategies or at least a mechanism to try and mitigate that lack of activity. But ultimately, you know, it's up for you to decide, I guess, if you're the parent and you think that, that, that it's too much of a, a challenge or whether or not the kids are suffering because there wasn't an indoor basketball season at Berkeley 2000 in the summer and the fall. I mean, that's why we're having the meeting. It gives people an opportunity to come and say, you know, my 12-year-old couldn't do this or that because we didn't have transportation. I hope that we can gather some of those comments and we, we come up with a viable solution sometime in the near future. But again, I lived on Woodbury. I, I've seen it. Um, I invited uh, the, the Ward 5 council person, the mayor, economic development. I've gotten a number of positive responses We'll see who shows. We'll collect the data and go from there. So, Jim, I, uh, just to make sure I'm I'm getting this right, if Jonathan wants to come to your meeting tomorrow and take two minutes and talk basketball, that's perfectly fine. Your meeting is not just seeing what folks might want with Lambert in the pool and a splash park or that situation. Yeah, it's a, it, the idea is is to hear from the people in the community, and whether or not it's Jonathan Bodwell or or anyone else. I have invited uh, Parks and Recreation. Bob was invited. Uh, I emailed Jennifer Smith, any of that constituency from the board. And my thought is, is that maybe that there could even be a very good explanation why the streamlined process took place. It could be very logical, very reasonable. And the idea is to provide that venue to have the open public discussion to get that information to the parents and to be prepared for the future. And that's the other thing. I mean, the final presentation of options isn't scheduled to be presented to city council by the, you know, until the end of 2023. We know that the pool will not be operational in 2024. So 2025, maybe, I mean, that's what we're thinking about right now when we might have another opportunity for kids there at that and at that specific location so i think now is the time to have the conversation with the parents not to kick the can till the end of 2023 and then go through the process of groundbreaking and all the other things that need to take place and jim just to wrap up uh, again summarize uh, the meeting particulars as to when and where yeah town hall tomorrow at 6 p.m uh, which is September 6th. We'll meet at uh, Moose Pavilion, 201 Woodbury Avenue. It's an outdoor meeting. We'll have a hard stop, 6 to 7 p.m., depending on the number of people who come, two minutes or less to speak, collect all the data, and then submit. Or, and maybe we'll even have some people show up with some answers, and I think that that might even help to to remove some of the vitriol that's accumulated and, and move together without – you know, being a divided community. Hey, by the way, have you officially received any responses from the officials you've invited that they will attend? 
I, you know, I, I, it's a mixed bag. I, I think it's probably best just to wait and see. And if you want me to come back on in a week or two and or, or maybe invite some of those people, that it, those decision makers, and that they can – express for themselves why they either cho chose to come or choose chose not to come that might be better i'm just trying to, to to collect voices well i know it won't be anybody from the parks and rec board who responds to me to come on the show <laughs> i can tell you that hey uh thanks jim i appreciate your time this morning hey thanks all have a thanks, great day jim.